That war was an emergency. It was on our mind every single hour of the day. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for right. When they said, I'm black and I'm proud, that meant something. It was the age of selfishness. It was the age of self-indulgence. It was the age of anti-authority. It was absolutely exhilarating. It was the greatest time to be alive ever, for sure. <laughs> The 60s was the last idealistic time. My thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. Thank you. I think an era ended with Robert Kennedy's death and Martin Luther King's and doomed us for some time, and we may still be in that time. I think Jack Newfield said it best when he said, uh, after that, we became um, might-have-beens, a generation of might-have-beens. I think there's an amount of bitterness and animosity that our generation is going to carry to its grave. The 60s, the years that shaped a generation, was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, something happened to a generation of young Americans that would mark them forever. It is a story of war, the struggle for racial equality, and the explosion of a counterculture. It was a time when a generation rebelled and lost its innocence. No one could have guessed in the early 1960s that a tiny Asian country would come to dominate the hearts and minds of a generation of young Americans. The decade that would end in disillusionment and rage began on a moral high note. It seemed that the time for racial equality in America had finally come. Because of a woman named Rosa Parks and a bunch of college kids who sat down at a Woolworth lunch encounter in 1960, and of course Martin Luther King, who was surely the most important American in the 20th century. It was their declaration that the world was going to change and that white men were no longer going to control everything in America and that everyone was finally going to be treated equally. It was their example which made everything else possible. In the mid-1960s, President Lyndon Johnson was flush with success from passage of the Civil Rights Act. This Civil Rights Act is a challenge to all of us to go to work in our communities and our states, in our homes and in our hearts, to eliminate the last vestiges of injustice in our beloved country. Johnson vowed to create a great society and declared war on poverty. But in the heat of an election campaign, Johnson made a fateful decision to commit additional American soldiers to an escalating war in Vietnam. It is my duty to the American people to report that renewed hostile actions against United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. It would later be determined that the Johnson administration had lied about the attack on the Maddox. But at the time, Congress was convinced and overwhelmingly passed the Tonkin Gulf Resolution. President Johnson was given virtually unlimited power to wage war in Southeast Asia. By Americanizing the war in Vietnam, 
President Johnson set in motion forces that would divide the country more bitterly than at any time since the Civil War. Conflict in Vietnam would prove the dark lens through which the entire decade was viewed. It was the first televised war, and the images were inescapable. Before the end of 1967, half a million American soldiers would be stationed in Vietnam. At first, Americans accepted the war as part of a larger struggle against communism. But after several years of bloodshed, many had begun to speak out in opposition. I speak out against this war, not in anger, but with anxiety and sorrow in my heart, and above all, with a passionate desire to see our beloved country stand as the moral example of the world. I speak out against this war because I am disappointed with America. The speech was very tough. I mean, we've turned King into, you know, a safe figure. He, he, in that speech, he said, my government is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. It was true. Explains why he could not be silent about it. It was a turning point. By 1967, the tide of public opinion had begun to turn against the war. Young people in particular began to rebel calling for a society that rejected war and violence. In June, the Beatles officially ushered in what would later be dubbed the Summer of Love with their hit song, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Burden and the animals gave the counterculture a world capital, the Haight-Ashbury neighborhood of San Francisco. was advertising the Haight-Ashbury, doing a lot of stories about him. Kids were coming here, and the police were harassing them, and there were no social services, and there were no, nothing offered to them. So the diggers just started to feed people, and so they were using my kitchen. The diggers named themselves after 17th century English radicals who had denounced private property. They begged, borrowed, and stole to provide free food. And with it, they offered a new way to see the world. The only thing you had to do to get this food was you had to step through a square frame made out of two by fours. It was about six foot by six foot. It was painted yellow, and it was called the free frame of reference. And you stepped through it, and they gave you a little one about this big to wear around your neck. And they just invited you to look through a free frame of reference. You know, what if it's free? What if it's free? So it was like a leaderless invitation to reinvent your own world, your own definitions of freedom. And the diggers basically understood that it was culture and the premises of culture that attached and bound and chained people. And that's what you had to shake up. You had to create new forms so that people could experience new ways of living. And if they liked them, they might defend them. Millions of young Americans had grown up in an era of unparalleled affluence. But here they were denouncing materialism, competition, and conformity, the very values that had paved the way for that affluence. It was also an era of sexual freedom, ushered in by the birth control pill, long before the emergence of AIDS. Marriage and monogamy seemed passé. Music and drugs would change the world, and the message was hard to resist. I was looking at the guys who weren't doing the acid as squares. I actually had thoughts like, you're letting your generation down, you know, if you don't try this. Uh, every, you got to try this. It's something that will liberate you. And uh, I firmly believed that um, it was possible to change the world. 
We were experimenting with a lot of things back then. We were experimenting with drugs. We were experimenting with relationships. We were experimenting with music. All of a sudden, I'm a guy who can play the guitar pretty well, and it's the 1960s, and guitar players are like leading the revolution. So I decide, heck, forget the school stuff, forget this lawyer stuff, forget the semantics, you know, go out there and play a guitar, you know, uh, uh, get a following, uh, start a revolution. You know? We had reached a moment in history where our traditional thoughts and traditional adherences to, tr to custom and to authority had brought us to the brink of a, of, a dis of a global disaster, the likes of which the world had never even thought about. And, s and enough people said, no, we're not doing this anymore. We're not just going thoughtlessly anymore. We've got to think for ourselves. You can't trust the authority. Conservatives were appalled by the anarchy of the counterculture. It broke loose in the 60s, accelerated enormously, uh, in large part because of an enormous generation of great size, which swamped the institutions that are supposed to civilize them, in part because of rock music. There were two very different movements going on at this time. One was a political movement that was dedicated almost entirely to ending the war in Vietnam. The other movement was, if you will, a consciousness movement. The musicians, in effect, bridged the two movements. We didn't have control of the radios or the TVs or the media or the press or anything. It all happened through the music in a language that the people who owned it didn't even understand. It was fabulous. And then there was a sort of word of mouth thing about this festival that was going to happen in Monterey. And then the next thing I knew, I was on a jet plane with uh, Brian Jones, Hendrix, and the experience. The Summer of Love began south of San Francisco, where the largest collection of rock bands yet assembled played to the largest crowd yet gathered. There would be bigger, more famous rock festivals in later years, but Monterey Pop became legendary as the first, and some say, the best. Monterey Pop culminated with a performance by a brilliant young guitarist named Jimi Hendrix. Hendrix ended his performance by setting his guitar on fire and smashing it on the stage. There had never been anything quite like it. Memorialized on film, the performance would later be viewed as a symbol for the counterculture itself, a grand gesture signifying the destruction of the old social order and everything it stood for. There was a force trying to uh, stabilize what was wrong and, and make a statement <clears throat> through music instead of through, through violence. I think for people my age back then, radio was the great secret common ground. It was the way we communicated with one another and it was where all of our prophets and leaders were. It was where Bob Dylan and the Beatles and the Supremes and Aretha Franklin and Laura Nero were, and they were all singing quite revolutionary messages, and they were the ones who bound us together.
While the white counterculture celebrated the summer of love, African Americans were undergoing a transformation of their own. Over a period of less than a year, you had people who were calm, respectable, responsible Negroes. All of a sudden, militants wearing dashikis with huge afros, taking Swahili class, identifying with the homeland. There is nothing more exhilarating or seductive than a change in consciousness. And in the 1960s, blacks made a transition, especially on the college campus, from being Negroes to being black to being Afro-Americans. When they said, I'm black and I'm proud, that meant something. Across the bay from San Francisco in Oakland, California, the Black Panther Party burst on the scene. Founded by Bobby Seale, a street smart community organizer, and Huey Newton, a charismatic young law student, angry with the police. Ironically, Newton's law school instructor was Ed Meese, later a close advisor and attorney general for President Ronald Reagan. Uh, Huey Newton, before he started the Black Panthers, was a student of mine. And uh, he was taking these courses he later wrote in his book so he would know what, the, what he called pigs knew. And uh, so he took my course. In the middle of the course, uh, one day he asked uh, if uh, he could ride to the courthouse with me. And so uh, I said, sure. I thought maybe he'd been so inspired by my teaching that he would want to see some court trials. Well, it turned out, actually, he was on trial. He had stabbed someone with a steak knife at a barbecue uh, some months before. Well, he was convicted of assault with a deadly weapon, a sentence to probation and a year in the county jail. A year later, he came back to my class, <laughs> and the other classes he was taking uh, finished got an A, and it was after that that he formed the Black Panthers. We are a new organization. We are observing these police who have been brutalizing our people in the community, and we're a political organization. We're going to try to unify the people, and we know the law. They provided uh, surveillance on police officers because Oakland at that time had one of the most racist police forces in the country. While we had an advancing, developing uh, expanding black middle class. We also had a uh, declining, eroding, um, uh, e expanding black underclass and lower class. Uh, the Black Panther Party was one of the few organizations that attempted to organize and advance the interests of that particular population. The Black Panthers were one manifestation of black America's growing frustration. Black communities in other cities simply exploded in rage. Beginning with Watts in 1965, black neighborhoods erupted with pent-up fury. On July 11, 1967, Newark, New Jersey burst into flame. The next week, it was Detroit, where, by the end of the third day, 100 blocks of the Motor City were engulfed in chaos and destruction. Finally, President Johnson sent in nearly 5,000 federal troops, but with orders that they carry unloaded weapons. Still, when the Detroit riots ended, there were 43 dead, 33 of them African Americans. The Kerner Commission report was, in my view, the most accurate, high-level public document on the problems of the inner cities that had been put in the public domain. Hoover was trying to convince Johnson that these riots were a communist plot. And so they had expected that these high-level people would find communists. Instead, they found racism. 
um, and they found a whole variety of American institutions implicated in it. The Kerner Commission stated that white society created, maintained, and condoned the black ghetto. It recommended a massive, sustained national commitment to ending discrimination. But the war in Vietnam would soon overshadow the war on poverty. The nation's attention had shifted to a tiny country called Vietnam. The president essentially spurned, shunned the Kerner Commission report. Vietnam. I had no idea. The next question is, well, why would my friends be sent there to die? Why were we killing people there? I mean, it was at that naive level, very, very, very simple kinds of questions. So that, then I took my first political act of my life, which is I wrote a letter to President Johnson. And um, I said, explain it. What is this? We are there to permit to the people of South Vietnam to determine for themselves who their leaders should be and what kind of a government to, they should have. Some have said we were there to uh, preserve the independence of an independent South Vietnam. Not at all. Uh, I am sure we hoped that uh, South Vietnam could be an independent state, uh, quote, a democratic, unquote, state. But that's not why we sent U.S. troops there. We sent U.S. troops there to prevent the control of South Vietnam by North Vietnam acting as a pawn of the Chinese Communists and the Soviet Communists, which we believed that it occurred would endanger the security of the West worldwide. The monolithic communism. The reason we were to be in Vietnam is if you don't stop them, they have to stop them in San Diego, okay? Look what happened. The Vietnamese win and they go to war with the Chinese. They didn't go to San Diego, they go to war with the Chinese. In the fall of 1967, the anti-war movement began to focus on the draft and draft resistance. The anti-war movement was the great example of enlightened self-interest. I mean, we did it because it was right, but we also did it because we didn't want to get killed. Though African Americans comprised less than 12% of the population, nearly a quarter of the U.S. Army was black. There were very few educated white people who went to Vietnam against their will. Early in the year, 25 years old and with no college deferment to protect him, heavyweight boxing champion Muhammad Ali had electrified the anti-war movement and the black community by refusing to be drafted. By the fall of 1967, a call arose from protest to resistance. Anti-war organizers began to plan a nationwide Stop the Draft week for October. It would culminate in a march on the Pentagon. One of the demonstrators was author Norman Mailer, who would later win the Pulitzer Prize for his book on the march, Armies of the Night. The majority of the people who came were middle class. They were essentially gentle people. They were not warriors. And they came with the expectation that they might even get a policeman's billy club on their head. For the first time since the Bonus March of 1932, federal troops guarded the capital. Nonviolent protesters surrounded the Pentagon and chanted, Om, claiming they would actually levitate the Pentagon. Paratroopers from the 82nd Division charged into the crowd. Dozens of demonstrators were beaten and arrested. I think Lyndon Johnson said to himself, if 50,000 of them will do that, there's got to be somewhere between 10 and 50 million people potentially behind them. Because I couldn't get 
50,000 people. I couldn't get 50,000 people down here to support this war if I paid their train fare. And I think something happened in him on that day. Something happened to McNamara. He's even written about it. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara had already begun to doubt U.S. policy in Vietnam. In June, he had directed members of his staff to research a list of questions about the war. Their answers would become the Pentagon Papers. I wandered in on that Saturday morning to McNamara's office. Uh, we were writing the Pentagon Papers in an office adjacent to that. And I went in not expecting to see him there. And he was there at a, in his room. I almost ducked out. He paid no attention to me. And I looked out again at the same scene he was looking out at. And um, I, I, I knew by that time that he agreed with them that um, what they were calling for was essentially right. I had tremendous admiration and respect and love for President Johnson, and I think he did for me. On November 1st, 67, I had presented him a very, very controversial memorandum that said essentially, we can't win the war militarily, uh, we've got to uh, change our strategy and, and in effect uh, withdraw. And I took it directly to him because I knew that he might disagree with it. I hadn't shown it to others. He did show it to a few others. Two of his closest advisors said McNamara is, in effect, recommending we surrender. It would be total defeat. We can't do it. He really understood very early on that this was a disaster. But like so many other people, he didn't have the courage to take Lyndon Johnson on in public. And therefore, he didn't contribute to a more rapid end of the war at all. I served as an appointee of the president. My obligation was to uh, support his programs. And if I couldn't, to leave. But I felt that I could do more inside than I could have outside. The people out in the streets were thinking in moral terms. Inside the policy chambers, it was driven by ambition, calculation, a, a political logic of survival, a cynicism from day one. McNamara's doubts about the war were not expressed publicly until many years later. But in the streets outside, tens of thousands were marching on the Pentagon. It's the only time I ever remember feeling emotion for hours. Not simple emotion either. I think the basic emotion was the depth and the tragedy of this moment. And is this country doomed or not? Are we going to tear apart or, or will we uh, mend this? Will we come together? Because at the moment, it really seemed uh, like there was no uh, reconciliation possible. By early 1968, the war in Vietnam had claimed over 15,000 American lives. Never before in U.S. history had such a vast number of people mobilized to protest a war. Why are you marching? Well, uh, I am personally marching with the Painters Union here in San Francisco, and we're uh, attempting to protest the war in Vietnam. You think this is going to help? I hope so. <laughs> Either that or a revolution, one or the other. The powerful in our country had ceased to be responsible, and so the powerless students, poor people, were trying to take some responsibility and say, here's how things should go. One politician dared to come forward, Eugene McCarthy, the senator from Minnesota. Well, as I see the campaign in 68, the issue of Vietnam itself is, is a vital one, of course, and you could pass a harsh judgment on that war if it were isolated altogether from any domestic consequences or... It's very intelligent, elegant, enigmatic poet from Minnesota who actually never wants to be president himself. He was this calm, civilized person who made it much easier for people to become anti-war because after all, at the beginning of 1968, it was still quite a radical thing to be. McCarthy, the outsider, attracted a loyal army of college students. It became known as the Children's Crusade. On the Republican side, Richard Nixon, a Cold War stalwart who'd lost two elections, 
was hoping to make the biggest comeback of his life. The presidential race was barely underway when all hell broke loose. During the Tet Lunar New Year at the end of January, Vietnamese communists launched their biggest offensive of the war, simultaneously attacking all the major cities and towns in South Vietnam. The surprise attack stunned Americans, especially when they watched on television as Viet Cong guerrillas stormed the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. Now CIA men and MPs have gone into the embassy and are trying to get the snipers out by themselves. The Tet Offensive failed militarily. The Vietnamese communists were driven out of the cities. But the fighting went on for more than a month and shattered forever the illusion of American omnipotence. Of all the nightmarish images that haunted Americans, the one that lingered longest was this, South Vietnam's police chief coldly executing a suspected Viet Cong guerrilla. These ruins are in Saigon, capital and largest city of South Vietnam. They were left here by an act of war. I went to Vietnam in 68 because of the Tet Offensive. The fact that uh, despite all of the propaganda that they could mount such an offensive when we had been told we were winning this war. It was a momentous moment when Cronkite got up out of his chair uh, and went to Vietnam and came back with these famous reports that the war was unwinnable and that we should look for an honorable way out. Well, Walter Cronkite didn't do things like that. This district used to be a model of pacification. Now again, most of it is at the mercy of the enemy. Correspondent Robert Shackney talked to Captain Donald Jones, deputy pacification advisor for the district. I walked unarmed with just one major casually through Go Boy in December. Could I do it today? No, you could not. You could not walk through Go Boy today. Are you discouraged? Yes. I was told by the military management of the war that with another 150,000 or 200,000, perhaps 300,000 troops, we could now finish the job. Well, that's what they'd been telling us for five years. Give us another 10,000, give us another 50,000. This sounded to me like more of the same. And uh, I came back with the conclusion that we were mired in stalemate and that the best thing for us to do was to acknowledge this fact, to negotiate with the people who had done the very best they could and, uh, and get out. George Christian, uh, who was Johnson's press secretary, said later that when Cronkite said what he said about the war, it was as if an earthquake had gone through the White House. The Vietnam War was the wheel on which the American establishment was broken, and Tet was the breaking point. The Tet Offensive gave life to the McCarthy campaign which was now attracting celebrities, like Paul Newman. You have areas where you feel your own rumblings and your own dissension and your own questioning. Then I think it's necessary to get behind the senator now. I liked McCarthy. I always did. I disagreed with him on the war. But the truth is, his campaign was magnificent up there in New Hampshire. Uh, he ran a, a very classy campaign. It was an intellectual's campaign but it wasn't egghead like Stevenson. He had a wonderful sense of humor. And the people who were behind McCarthy, those kids, the Be Clean for Gene kids, we would see them all over because we'd cross paths in New Hampshire. Uh, they were not radicals. They were intellectual, uh, and uh, they would pick at our motel, and I would go out and talk to them and argue with them. McCarthy and his student volunteers captured nearly 43% of the vote in New Hampshire, humiliating President Johnson. It was a symbolic upset with enormous repercussions. Immediately, Robert Kennedy, who had been vacillating, announced he too would run for president. It was Lyndon Johnson's worst political nightmare. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Tonight I want to speak to you of peace in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. No other question so preoccupies our people. On March 31st, Johnson announced a partial bombing halt of North Vietnam and called for peace talks. Then he dropped a bombshell of his own. I shall not seek and I will not accept 
the nomination of my party for another term as your president. People felt that they had won. A man whose uh, political power was uh, immense, uh, who had accomplished so much for evil and good, had suddenly said, I quit. You're often amazed when things that you devoutly wish for actually come to pass. And this was one of those moments. It seemed anything could happen now. It was the magic of 1968. McCarthy or Kennedy might be president. The war might actually end. For those who wanted social change, it was a moment of pure euphoria. At the end of March in Memphis, Tennessee, garbage workers who were mostly black and grossly underpaid were out on strike. These men who were really at the low rung on the, on the totem pole just got tired of being treated less than men. And if you notice that sign they had, it didn't say peace, it didn't say freedom, it didn't say justice. All it said was, I am a man. Somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Martin Luther King, the nation's preeminent civil rights leader, came to Memphis to express moral support for the men on strike. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for rights. On March 28th, the Memphis police were out in force. About 12,000 demonstrators gathered to march down Beale Street in support of the garbage workers. King was planning to lead a poor people's march on Washington that summer, an ambitious new campaign focusing on economic justice. Memphis was supposed to be the dry run. There was a group of young guys called the Invaders, some of whom were on the FBI's payroll. We didn't know that at the time. But they were there really to stir up trouble. These young guys had taken the sticks off of the placards, started breaking out windows, and they started the riot. And you know, once you start, everybody gets in it. And rather than try and isolate the people who were rioting, the police just waded into the crowd, just beating people indiscriminately, just, just, just beating them. It was, it was, it was horrible. Martin was taken up physically, put in a car, and taken to the closest hotel for his own safety. And he said, we've got to have a peaceful march. If we don't do it here, we can't go to Washington. King was despondent. Others were losing faith in his nonviolent philosophy. Maybe his time was past. Martin Luther King was at a crossroads. Despite doubts, despite death threats, he refused to turn back. On the night of April 3rd, he appeared before a packed congregation at Mason Temple. It was thundering and lightning, and the rain was coming hard. And, it, and Martin didn't take a text. We called it a mountaintop speech. He just started speaking extemporaneously. And I'd not heard him. Of all the speeches I'd, times I'd heard him speak, I'd not heard him like this. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life, longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy to 
tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. I feel that he was going through a purging of his fear that I no longer fear death. He always said he would not live to be 40. He didn't think he would. He wanted to, but he never thought he'd live to be 40 years old. He was 39 when he was killed. The next day, meeting with aides at his motel, King seemed rejuvenated. As evening approached, he stepped out on the balcony to talk with Jesse Jackson and others. And we're on our way to Reverend Billy Kyle's home for dinner. And I remember we had our, our little band there from Chicago, Ben Branch and some musicians, and we were going to have a big rally at Mason Temple that night after dinner. So I was coming across the courtyard, and he said, Yes, we're late for dinner. I said, Doc, I've been waiting for you. He said, but you don't have your town. I said, Doc, you know a tie is not a prerequisite for dinner, just an appetite. He said, boy, you're crazy. Then he said to Ben, said, play my favorite song tonight for me. Precious Lord, Ben said, I will. And I said, Doc, he said, yes. And he said, yes, the bullet hit right here. And they just knocked him back against the wall, and it was over. The police were coming toward us with drawn guns. We were saying, the, the, gun, the bullet came from the, that way. It couldn't have come from this way. Why are you coming toward us with drawn guns? It came from that way. It came from that way. In black communities across the country, the reaction to King's assassination was a violent eruption of rage and despair. Rioting broke out in more than 100 cities. 20,000 army regulars and 34,000 National Guardsmen were mobilized. In Chicago, Mayor Richard Daley ordered police to shoot to kill. Nationwide, 46 people died. Martin Luther King was dead. America was burning. Many feared that the last hope for racial equality and nonviolence had been extinguished. This seemed like uh, the definitive statement. You know, America tried to redeem itself, and now, you know, they've killed the man who was taking us to the mountain. With the troubles of the world Troubles of the world Ooh, Troubles of the world With the trouble of, of the world, we're going home to live with God. I'm going home. You know, even though we expected it, when it happened, you know, you, it's, it's, you, you didn't know what to do. And we stayed in shock for a very long time, a very long time. At this point, I had been so knocked out of my middle class assumptions that I didn't know what would happen. Perhaps the country could be reformed and Robert Kennedy would be present, president. Perhaps we'd be plunged into a civil war. I'd be imprisoned and killed. Anything was, it was... It, was, it seemed impossible to tell what country we were in and what, what was about to happen. Higher education was opening up in the 60s. It wasn't just a social elite, but you're getting the children of working class people, very high expectations.
1968 was the year of the student. There were seven million enrolled in American colleges, and the mood on campus was unmistakably rebellious. People cutting class to go off on demonstrations or to march on Washington and so forth. And a general lack of civility and a general disrespect for uh, uh, intellectual activity, uh, which was regarded as, as they used to say, not relevant. In the spring of 1968, Columbia University in New York became the flashpoint of student revolt. There were two demands. End Columbia's affiliation with IDA, a military think tank, and stop construction of a university gym that would replace a park in Harlem. On April 23rd, a crowd of black and white students tore down fences at the construction site, only to be driven back by police. The retreating students decided spontaneously to occupy several campus buildings. The atmosphere, as far as anything I know, was very peaceable in those occupied buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of friends of mine actually got married in their building. Andrea Egan and her husband got married. That's one of the places where women's liberation was born in those occupied buildings. And, you know, just over simple things like women saying, hey, why should we be serving, the, preparing the food? The lifestyle was communal. Drugs and liquor were banned by popular vote, but food and drink were smuggled in. And as the occupation continued, in between the talk of theory and tactics, there was a lot of playfulness. University President Grayson Kirk was not amused. Our young people, in disturbing numbers, appear to reject all form of authority, he said. I know of no time in our history when the gap between the generations has been wider or more potentially dangerous. When they took over the campus and they put feces in the, somebody's office and they're throwing people's papers out and they're getting professors, taking their life work and throwing it out on the floor, I wrote a statement for Nixon and some of the Nixon people were really opposed and I just denounced the demonstrators 100% at fault, overprivileged kids. The first thing we did when we got into Kirk's office was hit his files. Besides uh, a bunch of crap in his girly magazines, we found a bunch of papers linking Columbia to the IDA, uh, a whole bunch of sh** about putting down SDS, and a lot of letters about cleaning up the area by moving out the blacks and the Puerto Ricans. After a week, the administration had had enough. They called in the police to clear out all five occupied buildings. We have been informed that the police department will take all the necessary action in connection with our complaint against you. It was class warfare a thousand blue-collar New York cops against some radical Ivy League kids. Watch it, watch it. Okay, get back. Bring them into the door. Well, I, I dropped my glasses when I was running. I asked a cop officer, could I please go back? And he whacked me in the f***ing face. I was completely shocked when the police went in and beat up people so, so badly. Nothing prepared me for that. Nearly 150 people were injured, and many were arrested. But President Kirk was forced to resign, and eventually the students won most of their demands. Students were at like a revolutionary breaking point. I remember some poll that said one million college students self-described themselves as revolutionaries. It wasn't just the United States. It was international. Students in Germany, France, Japan, Ireland, China, Mexico had all taken to the streets. 
demanding everything, student power, an end to the war in Vietnam, or simply more freedom. We were hearing by 1968 in this country, over and over we were hearing the analysis that we were uh, a generation of spoiled kids, that we were uh, Dr. Spock's kids, that permissive child raising, which actually I never experienced in my own life, but uh, was, the, was the source of the movement. Well, that couldn't have been true in Germany. It was not true in Italy. I mean, it was not true in Japan. You know, and the fact that it was international, I think, completely refutes that very simplistic psychological argument, which we heard all the time. Everything that happened overseas um, fueled the sense that we were on the cusp of some momentous change in the history of the world. The Columbia strike may have reminded people of the Paris Commune, but May 68 in France was the real thing. What began as a student protest for reform of the archaic authoritarian French university system sparked a general strike that electrified the country. They were anarchists, most of them. That was the spirit. Uh, the slogan was all power to the imagination, uh, that you can do anything, you know, that we don't have to live with all the various forms of repression, which we're used to. So it was anti-capitalist, but that was just part of this general, complete sort of cultural revolution that the, uh, the French students were anticipating. And so it's interesting that although they were the furthest out in any way politically, that was also the one place where workers joined with students and almost toppled the government. May 10th, the night of the barricades. 20,000 students marched in the Latin Quarter. Police and students clashed. Street fighting went on for weeks. The rioting and marches of up to half a million people frightened not only President de Gaulle, but the French Communist Party as well. The old left thought this new left was out of control, that they had impossible dreams. The two principal slogans, I think, were quotations from uh, Marx and Rimbaud. Uh, from Marx, uh, let us change the world. From Rimbaud, let us change life. Carlos Fuentes, the Mexican novelist, was an active participant in May 68, along with many international students caught up in the excitement. What there was was a sense of extraordinary uh, brotherhood and sisterhood. Uh, there was this capacity to embrace people in the streets. Uh, there were couples kissing. There were couples that fell apart because they did not share political views. Paris was divided by the River Seine as never before. On the left bank, you had the, the left, the revolutionaries, the dreamers. On the right side, you had the conservatives, you had the Gaullists, you had the fi financiers, the money people, the bourgeoisie. So the city was divided uh, as much as in uh, Les Miserables, in Victor Hugo, or in any of the great occasions of this city that seems to need a great uh, revolutionary explosion from time to time. Eventually, the May uprising subsided. The powerful trade unions controlled by the communists refused to take part, and police kept up relentless pressure. But over time, the students did succeed in reforming and modernizing the French educational system. And they rejuvenated the Socialist Party, which a decade later became the elected government of France. It became a great, gigantic fraternal feast in which everybody was kissing everybody, embracing everybody, patting everybody on the back, and say how happy they were and how free they felt. And this was contagious. It was marvelous. And I don't think we'll ever see it again. By late spring, the presidential primaries were in full swing. Eugene McCarthy was more popular than ever with college students, like the thousands who cheered him at Berkeley. I think there are really three agencies of government that need to be somewhat altered. One is the Central Intelligence Agency. The second is the FBI. And and the third of the draft boards under General Hershey. McCarthy supporters were suspicious of Robert Kennedy, who they regarded as an opportunist. But it was also clear that Kennedy was a more charismatic campaigner and was appealing to a broader coalition, not just students, 
but blue collar workers, women, a wide range of minority groups, and the poor. Kennedy himself was undergoing a dramatic political transformation. The man who was known as Ruthless, who had been a hawk on Vietnam, was now calling for peace and becoming an advocate for the dispossessed. I think one thing that happened to him was that his brother was murdered. Um, and I think that had a profound impact on him. On an airplane during the campaign, someone asked him, may have been Jack Newfield, uh, what's your position on the capital punishment? Some issue had come up. And uh, he said, I'm against it. And whoever it was said to him, well, uh, um, when you were at the Justice Department, that wasn't your position when you were Attorney General. And he said, well, then I hadn't read Camus. Well, what politician, first of all, reads Camus, and second, uses it as a reason for having changed a position? Albert Camus, the French existentialist, had written about the rebel spirit. And the Kennedy campaign, though run by professionals, began to take on an anti-establishment character. In California, Kennedy made common cause with Cesar Chavez and his farm workers' union. Well, I share that more romantic version of uh, the Kennedy story. Um, but again, it's one of those stories in which we project our own fantasies and our own hopes. The California primary was the showdown between Kennedy and McCarthy, the two candidates calling for change within the system, the two rebel spirits. On June 4th, it was Kennedy who emerged victorious. It was after midnight. The ballroom at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles was jammed, the heat stifling. But Kennedy was at his best. What I think is quite clear is, is that we can work together in the last analysis, and that what has been going on within the United States over the period of the last three years, the divisions, the violence, the disenchantment with our society, the divisions, whether it's between blacks and whites, between the poor and the more affluent, or between age groups, or on the war in Vietnam, that we can start to work together. We are a great country, and a selfish country, and a compassionate country. And I intend to make that my basis for running in over the period of that year. The anti-war movement, the reformers, now had a presidential candidate who might actually win. The country wants to move in a different direction. We want to deal with our own problems within our own country, and we want peace in Vietnam. <laughs> The minute he finished, I turned and walked through this uh, pantry area on my way to, the, to where the press conference would be held, and Kennedy was, was right behind me. And um, I heard the shots r ring out, and I turned, and um, he was already down and uh, bleeding badly, and uh, the place went crazy. It was, it was an absolute scene of bedlam. And after the whole scene was over and Kennedy was removed, a number of my colleagues, including a couple of uh, burly photographers, uh, broke down, put their heads down on, the, um, on, a, on this um, serving table and, and wept openly. An extraordinary thing happened when Kennedy's body was transported by train to Washington for burial at Arlington National Cemetery. Thousands of people spontaneously appeared along the tracks in silent tribute. with Robert Kennedy's death and Martin Luther King's, uh, an era in which we could have accomplished great things working together and doomed us for some time and we may still be in that time to be shattered, fragmented, and uh, something less than uh, the people we could be. And I think Jack Newfield said it best when he said uh, after that we became uh, might have been a generation of might have been. The 
Republican convention in Miami was a world apart, safe from turmoil. Nixon and his running mate Spiro Agnew appealed to those they called the forgotten Americans, yearning for stability, law, and order. All of the crises of the 60s were coming together at once. The student, the anti-war demonstrations, uh, the, uh, the, the turning of the civil rights movement away from sort of non-violent demonstrations to get laws changed to, to riots and uh, quasi-revolution. And uh, I, think, uh, I think there was a sense that the country was coming apart and here we were, suddenly we weren't, we we're losing the war. My fellow Americans, the long, dark night for America is about to end. The The time has come, the time has come for us to leave the valley of despair and climb the mountain so that we may see the glory of the dawn, a new day for America and a new dawn for peace and freedom in the world. But at the Democratic Convention in Chicago, the system was falling apart on national television. It was one of these um, dreadful and amazing confrontations where where the, the forces that have been building for a long time come into collision. Leaders of the anti-war movement, Dave Dellinger, Abby Hoffman, and Tom Hayden, were determined to protest at the Democratic Convention. Richard J. Daley. Mayor Richard Daley, the last of the big city bosses, was not about to let that happen. Daley would not grant permits allowing protesters to march or hold rallies. As long as I'm mayor of this town, there'll be law and order in Chicago. The city was an armed camp. There were 12,000 police, 6,000 Illinois National Guardsmen, another 6,000 Army troops, including some just back from Vietnam. There were never more than about 10,000 demonstrators easily outnumbered by police and soldiers. Some of us felt, I, I was certainly one of them, that it was altogether likely that we would, we would not come out of the week alive. Somebody was not going to make it through the week. Wednesday, August 28th, was the day everything exploded. It began with a peaceful rally at the Bandshell in Grant Park. Anti-war organizers were still planning to march to the convention. But when a young protester climbed the flagpole and lowered the American flag, the police charged. That afternoon at the convention, Democrats voted down the peace platform. For McCarthy and Kennedy delegates, it was a bitter defeat. Back on the streets, angry, frustrated demonstrators managed to reassemble in front of the Hilton Hotel, where the candidates had their headquarters. They were just as nasty and crude and awful and ugly as they could be. And you could see those cops were just sitting there seething with anger and resentment over it. Under the full glare of TV lights and cameras, the police attacked. They clubbed indiscriminately, protesters, reporters, bystanders. The official government investigation would call this a police riot. In a confrontation that would be replayed countless times, Connecticut Senator Abraham Ribicoff denounced Mayor Daley's police. With George McGovern as President of the United States, we wouldn't have to have Gestapo tactics in the streets of Chicago. Mr. Daly is not pleased with Senator Ribicoff. How hard it is to accept the truth. And he looked at Mayor Daly. That night, Hubert Humphrey won the Democratic nomination, but it was a hollow victory. You had Hubert Humphrey weeping in the shower from the effects of tear gas that was being spread 
in the park beneath the Conrad Hilton Hotel. The way it played out was extremely dramatic, but what played out there was, was a fact, that the Democratic Party was, was finished. And Nixon used an effective line after that Democratic convention. He said, look, if they can't unite their party, how can they unite the country? And he was right. But the truth was, I don't think anybody could have united us in 1968. Just a few days before Daly called the army into Chicago, Russian tanks invaded Prague. They made uh, Mayor Daley look like a pacifist. Many anti-war Americans identified with the young, free-thinking Czech students who wanted to change the old communist system. Dubček, who represented the Prague Spring, he was like a, a mild reformer. And this, this tremendous movement grew in Prague which thought that it was going to change the world, just like we did. And, you know, it did finally, and God bless them, but they paid a big price of almost 30 years before it finally happened. Preoccupied with the war in Vietnam, the United States took no action to stop the Russians. The Czechs had little to defend themselves beyond their own powers of persuasion. Invited by the Czech author Milan Kundera to observe what was happening, Carlos Fuentes and other writers came to Prague. We were witnesses to the fact that uh, this was a revolution to give socialism a human face, as Dubček had said, and this other revolution of the year 1968 was trampled by the Soviet Union, which did not want socialism with uh, any face. It wanted a Soviet imperial domination of its perimeter of defense. To have a, a policy that cares for the society, that takes care of the society, but it also respects a, a personal freedom. This is what the Czechs wanted, and of course the Soviet Union would not tolerate it. And it was the beginning of the end, I think, for the Soviet empire. 20 years later, the Velvet Revolution ended Soviet domination of Czechoslovakia. And playwright Vaclav Havel, a veteran of the Prague Spring, became president of a democratic country. In 1968, here was Paris, Chicago, Prague, and finally Mexico City. This plaza, the scene of another bloody confrontation. It had been building all summer. Mexican students were on the march challenging an authoritarian government that claimed to be democratic. On the night of October 2nd, students filled the plaza. Soldiers with fixed bayonets surrounded them. Suddenly, without warning, a helicopter hovering overhead opened fire. They wanted something called freedom. Imagine, as simple as that. They wanted freedom, and they went out in the streets to demand this freedom. And the answer of the government was to mow them down in October 2nd, 1968, at Tlatelolco, the Plaza of the Free Cultures, Tlatelolco, the same place where Pedro de Alvarado had massacred the Aztecs in 1521. The massacre, known as the Night of Sorrow, was the worst single disaster of 1968. But the world barely noticed. The Mexican government shrouded the massacre in secrecy. Only recently has it been officially acknowledged and investigated. But it was a turning point in Mexican history the night when one party rule lost whatever legitimacy it had. From this terrifying event in which over 500 young men and women died, uh, a new Mexico was born. A new democratic Mexico that has finally flowered in these days, in the 1990s. It took a long time, but it would not have happened without the events of 1968. The massacre took place just before the Olympics in Mexico City and horrified Harry Edwards, who was organizing a boycott of the games by black athletes. There were so many people being picked up, uh, so many people being killed, that they were literally hauling out corpses uh, in fishnets under helicopters like they did in Vietnam, because they did not want uh, uh, mass funerals and so forth, uh, either just prior to, and most certainly not during the, the Olympic Games. The world heard very little about the student massacre, but no one missed the black power protests at the Olympics by American sprinters Tommy Smith and John Carlos. Smith and Carlos' demonstration was not anti-American. It was pro-human 
rights, and most specifically, pro-black rights. People either wept and cheered or they were outraged to the rafters. Smith and Carlos were expelled from the Olympics, but their black power salute became one of the most provocative and enduring images of 1968. Another protest movement would emerge by summer's end. Spearheaded by veterans of the anti-war and civil rights movements, it tapped into a deep well of anger at the inequalities between men and women. One early participant was Susan Brown Miller, a TV news writer who thought she was finished with activism. A friend of mine said to me one day, you know, women are meeting and they're really talking about women's issues. And I said, I don't believe it. And she said, well, there's a meeting uh, next Tuesday. Maybe you'd want to come. Everyone goes around the room and speaks from their own experience. And they began to talk about unwanted pregnancy and how each of them had coped with it. And it was my turn. And I was older. You know, I was in my 30s. They were in their 20s. And I'm a competitive person, and I'm thinking to myself, they're talking about one abortion, huh? So I said, I've had three abortions, all illegal. And then I started to cry. And I said, I guess I'm lucky to be alive. And what was so astonishing about that moment is that my best friend Jen, who had brought me to this meeting, didn't know about those abortions. You told nobody, you know, you made your arrangements, you went off secretly. In 1968 in New York, it was a first for women to say, yeah, I had an illegal abortion. What's that got to do with, with boyfriends? From the privacy of consciousness-raising groups, the women's liberation movement quickly catapulted itself into the public arena. With picket signs in their hands and guerrilla theater tactics up their sleeves, 100 women converged on the Miss America pageant in Atlantic City. But first, they had notified the press, which turned out in force. The Miss America contest was so mind-boggling to reporters because no one had thought that maybe some of us didn't like the idea of a beauty contest where women paraded in bathing suits and uh, high heel shoes. We, the radical activists, knew how to put on a good demo, you know. It was the radical movement's first national action. The demonstrators had hoped to burn bras, like draft cards, but the city refused to grant them a fire permit. Famous for a bra burning that never happened, the protest generated enormous publicity and debate. Despite the lack of actual flames, the Miss America pageant protest sparked a social revolution that is still underway. I caught you cheating and running around. There's a smile up on your face while another takes my place and there'll be laughter and instead of tears. More than ever, conservative Americans thought the country and the world were on the verge of a nervous breakdown. They wanted law and order. George Wallace was their man. Well, I'm for Wallace because I feel that uh, all through history, whenever times became so difficult, a leader has arose, and this is the leader. Independent presidential candidate George Wallace had once declared segregation forever. Now the Alabama governor was holding rallies as far north as San Francisco, and polls in October showed him winning 20% of the vote. What do you think's wrong with America? With America, the rioting, the trouble in the streets, the trouble in our schools, the Supreme Court, uh, which is almost, well, let's say, we think is pro-communist. 
Now let's talk about law and order a moment. And we need to talk about it, but really you don't have to talk about it. You see it all around you all the time. The breakdown of law and order. The reaction that he stirred scared me uh, because he had the capacity of just working up a crowd to a, f to a frenzy. When that same group from Berkeley were groveling around in their beards and filth in Salem, Alabama for eight weeks, the Washington Post said, it is a great and holy crusade, and now they've created themselves a Frankenstein monster, and the chickens are coming home to roost all over this country. Wallace enjoyed responding to the protesters who heckled him. Come up here after I've completed my speech, and I'll autograph your sandals for you. I'll let you uh, do that, and I'll. Uh... Oh, yeah, good haircut would help you. I think that's all your problem. Good barber could cure you. It was really the uh, beginning of what is today the, uh, the phenomenon of the angry white man. And I'll tell you, they ought to take them people over there and put them in a bunch of cages and ship them off in a ship and dump them. Or take them to Vietnam, get them off, put them on the front line and bring our boys back and A-bomb them guys. It also contained an element of economic populism that was very important. Of course, his people were trying to beat the hell out of me, so it's it hard for me to see their economic agenda. <laughs> The more mainstream law and order candidates, Nixon and Agnew, built up a commanding lead over Hubert Humphrey. Nixon ran a very controlled, almost antiseptic campaign, dominated by Madison Avenue advisors, who recommended carefully orchestrated appearances. It would later be described as the selling of the president. The Humphrey campaign was stalled. He was afraid to break with President Johnson and speak out against the war. He's a truly tragic figure. I mean, he's a, a, a real visionary from 1948 on. He makes his first name with a fantastic speech in favor of civil rights in 1948 at the Democratic National Convention. And throughout the 50s and 60s, he's a real beacon of liberalism. But Johnson treats him terribly, as Lyndon Johnson put it very specifically, don't worry about Hubert, I've got his pecker in my pocket. After the debacle in Chicago, the anti-war movement was boycotting Humphrey. There were some of us who already were thinking, you know, Nixon would not be the end of the world. People like I.F. Stone had argued you get, you get a better shot at peace with a Republican than with a Democrat because they don't have to worry about being red-baited. But it would never have entered my mind to vote for Hubert Humphrey, uh, who was, as far as I was concerned, was deeply implicated in the war. People threw excrement at him and called his wife a whore. And the great irony, of course, was that throughout the fall campaign, all of the anti-war demonstrators continuously harassed Humphrey and ignored Nixon altogether. And that was a tragedy. This is one of the greatest mistakes of the 60s, in my view. Um, the election was so close that you can attribute many factors to the margin of difference. But certainly one of the factors was that uh, those who, were, who hated the war decided to be so pure as to sit it out. I was one of them. Uh, I know very few people who voted in that year, and we were wrong. One of the missed opportunities in the movement uh, during the war was not to imagine how many insiders there were that essentially agreed with them, and to have pressed them, to challenge them more, to speak out more openly. And it's not until September 30th in a famous speech in Salt Lake City where he finally puts a little bit of distance between himself and the president and says, I will be in favor of a bombing halt. And the next day, he's at the University of Tennessee, and there's this incredible sign in the crowd saying, if you mean it, were with you. I think if he had renounced the war uh, and the Johnson war policy uh, maybe a few weeks sooner, uh, he might very well have won that election. He came very, very close. Richard Nixon won by a razor thin margin, less than 1% of the vote. The Vietnam War would last seven more years. Johnson's war would become Nixon's war. 
the political divisions that erupted in 1968 would soon widen into chasms. 68 is the cusp between uh, the hope and the rage, and it's in many ways the years when the most benign hopes burned out or were obliterated. Richard Nixon was now president, and Ronald Reagan was governor of California. Together, they would lead a backlash against rebellious students and the anti-war movement. As 1969 dawned, the most sustained student demonstrations of the decade were already underway, not at an elite school, but at a state college, and not over the war, but over identity. The origins of college and university ethnic studies departments nationwide were forged in the heat of a 134-day strike at San Francisco State College. Governor Reagan sent his executive assistant, Ed Meese, to San Francisco to support the college's tough new president, S.I. Hayakawa. One of my jobs was to make sure that uh, President Hayakawa was safe uh, because there was some uh, thought that they might try to storm his office. So uh, we had the necessary police and state resources there to protect him. Dissident forces decided that they would stage a major demonstration. The San Francisco Police Department, a prison demonstrating here, are unlawfully assembled. President Hayakawa personally got on top of the truck and pulled out the wires and silenced the sound truck. S.I. Hayakawa, in essence, became sort of a hitman for Ronald Reagan. The striking students ultimately won a black studies department, but in the process, 700 were arrested. College President S.I. Hayakawa went on to become a United States Senator. Governor Reagan found the conflict a useful trial run for his next challenge in nearby Berkeley, where anti-war students and counterculture youth joined forces to claim some undeveloped university land as their own. The great hope implicit in the people's part is that in our leisure time, so to speak, we will make the social revolution. The spirit which built the people's park is stronger than gas and clubs. It is even stronger than universities. I want to inform you that this property is private. It is posted. You are now trespassing. And so the uh, university set out to move the people who were lounging around on the property uh, off of the property and put up fences so that they could begin the construction. Leftist the organizers, uh, some students, some non-students, uh, decided that they would use that as the pretext for a demonstration and a protest. They uh, tried to kill police officers. They hurled spikes from the top of buildings on the police. Governor Reagan, expressing the fury that many officials felt at youthful defiance, stated, if it takes a bloodbath, let's get it over with. No more appeasement. Alameda County sheriffs shot over 50 protesters with buckshot. One protester died. What happened to James Rector was uh, the result of his being involved in illegal activity. 
Reagan called in the National Guard, which quelled the disturbance. They occupied Berkeley for a month, leaving the Bay Area activist community brokenhearted and demoralized. That summer, one dream was realized and another vanquished. On July 20th, the space program, founded by President John Kennedy, triumphed with a walk on the moon. The day before, JFK's only surviving brother, Senator Ted Kennedy, saved his own life after a car accident. But his presidential promise died along with his drowned companion. But I really didn't become totally dispirited until Ted Kennedy went off the bridge at Chappaquiddick. Ted has been a terrific senator, whatever else you might say. For him. He's been a terrific senator. And he was the last person who scared Nixon. And once Ted went off that bridge, Nixon veered to the right. And that was that, and I knew it. And for me, that was when the 60s ended. For America's counterculture, the 60s were about to peak on a farm in upstate New York. There's people as far as the eye can see in every direction, under every tree, under every leaf, on every road. And I remember being in this helicopter and the door was open and this big cop looked down and said, there's a lot of hippies down there. And I'm going, well, yeah. And the cop next to him going, yeah. And the first cop said, I bet they're doing lots of illegal stuff. And the next one said, yeah. And the first one said, I'm not going in there or nothing, no. <laughs> and I suddenly realized, man, this was going to be a party. This was going to be fun. Despite overcrowding and rain, the party lasted for three days. MC Wavy Gravy announced to a sea of bodies and mud that festival organizers would be serving breakfast in bed for 400,000. Woodstock is distinguishable not only because it was the largest pop festival of its time, but it was also, in effect, the last. Four months later, a festival promoted as Woodstock West turned into anti-Woodstock. The Rolling Stones headlined a concert at Altamont, east of San Francisco, where the counterculture had so famously blossomed. The Altamont concert ended in violence and disarray. Something seemed to have gone terribly wrong. Gangsters moved in. Kilos of weed got exchanged for bricks. People were shot. There were murders. There was this and that. The whole tenor of things got uglier and harder and meaner. Marred by violence and drug abuse, Altamont sealed the fate of large-scale free concerts. The expansive spirit of the love generation would never be quite the same again. A lot of us fell right off the edge, and I was one of them, and uh, uh, a lot of us were really hurt by hard drugs. The counterculture paid a price for its excesses. In the next few years, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, and Jim Morrison would be dead, all from drug abuse. Many former urban dwellers sought to build a new life in the country. Communal living and homegrown food would be the antidote to the excesses of the city. And there came a movement to become land-based, to get uh, below the skin of asphalt, as somebody called it. It's where I live here now in Mendocino County. Many, many people came here in the 60s in full retreat from the urban environment, deciding that if we're going to create a new society, we just have to forget their society and go start one of our own.
As Nixon's first year in the White House came to a close, the number of Americans being killed in Vietnam remained high. We wanted to end the war, but you can't turn this thing off as if it were a television channel. Nixon's new strategy was Vietnamization. He began to withdraw American troops, announcing that South Vietnam would take over the ground war. Privately, he began direct negotiations with the North Vietnamese, excluding South Vietnam's President Thieu. Simultaneously, he ordered massive secret bombings in Laos and Cambodia. What we attempted to do was to uh, extricate the United States from Vietnam, but to do it in such a way that it would not affect our international responsibilities around the world. More people die, more Americans, and no doubt Vietnamese die during the Nixon, we're on our way getting out years, than during the Kennedy and Johnson years put together. A nationwide moratorium on October 15, 1969, called for immediate withdrawal from Vietnam. With protests in every city across the country, it became the largest one-day demonstration ever in a Western democracy. Unknown to its participants, the moratorium would significantly alter Nixon's war plans. He was making secret threats of escalation to North Vietnam, secretly from the American public, but not at all secret, of course, from the target of these threats. In short, he made those threats explicitly to the Soviets for the Vietnamese and directly to the Vietnamese, that he was prepared to use nuclear weapons. The march of the moratorium in cities across the country on October 15th, just before his secret ultimatum, was too large. Two million people on one day across the country convinced him reasonably that this was not the time to escalate the war, and in particular, not the time to use nuclear weapons for the first time since Hiroshima. It was pretty clear that there was so much protest in the, within our country that, uh, that it was very difficult to conduct uh, the war at all. Nixon's public response, a speech he wrote himself, was a masterstroke. So tonight, to you, the great silent majority of my fellow Americans, I ask for your support. I pledged in my campaign for the presidency to end the war in a way that we could win the peace. I have initiated a plan of action which will enable me to keep that pledge. Let us be united for peace. Let us also be united against defeat. Because let us understand, North Vietnam cannot defeat or humiliate the United States. Only Americans can do that. And so then the press attacked it, savaged it. And so I wrote Nixon a memo. We said, it's time to attack the media. And I said, the Vice President of the United States ought to deliver this speech. And so I wrote that uh, Agnew speech. And there was one editor for that Agnew speech, Richard Milhouse Nixon. And he said, this will tear the scab off those bastards. And we broke out laughing. <laughs> and it did. <laughs> Perhaps the place to start looking for a credibility gap is not in the offices of the government in Washington, but in the studios of the networks in New York. He was the point man for Richard Nixon's and Richard Nixon's war against the countercultures. And then with speeches by William Sapphire and Pat Buchanan, he became eventually the hero of the right wing for his attacks on the press. Like Nixon's silent majority, Agnew's famous phrases, effete snobs, and nattering nabobs of negativism served to further polarize the country. Exactly one month after the moratorium, 700,000 Americans converged on Washington. The administration had already ordered the FBI to monitor the demonstration 
convinced that it was influenced by communists. While a handful tried to storm the South Vietnamese embassy, Yale chaplain William Sloan Coffin and Dr. Benjamin Spock led a peaceful march against death from Arlington Cemetery to the White House. Attorney General John Mitchell said it looked like the Russian Revolution. It was the very deep sense of patriotism that animated many of us, not all of us, you know. Sure, there was a certain amount of defiance, revolt, uh, adolescence, if you will, but that's overdone. Our first contingent in this march against death. There are facilities in the White House in case of a bombing attack. I moved into one of these facilities for a few days and slept in the basement of the White House. And, uh, you know, the White House was ringed by students that were protesting. It didn't interfere with what we were doing, but it was uncomfortable. The following spring, on April 30th, 1970, President Nixon announced that American troops had entered Cambodia. By early 1970, anti-war sentiment is so sweeping in America, not only in public opinion, but on the campuses in particular, that it doesn't require any leadership. Protests erupted on campuses nationwide. The murder of four students at Kent State and two at Jackson State by National Guardsmen shocked and further divided the nation. It was as if um, the relationships between the generations had cracked up um, on some fundamental level. And yes, it was, it was about the Vietnam War. It was about uh, race. It was about poverty. But these things seemed to be reflections of a failure on the part of the older generation that was so profound. The movement was moving left and the country was moving right. Uh, the country was polarizing. Increasing numbers of white radicals began to aspire to the more confrontational model of the Black Panthers. I have these Black Panthers up here with guns on the second floor. Am I under arrest? Am I under arrest? Take your hands off me if I'm not under arrest. The Panthers ran on two levels, you know. I mean, we now know that Huey was kind of a schizophrenic guy, a brilliant idealist and a thug. And there were those two strains in the Panthers. They would do breakfast programs for kids, and then they would do thuggery. In America, black people are treated very much as uh, the Vietnamese people or any other colonized people because we're used, we're brutalized. The police in our community occupy uh, our uh, area, our community as a foreign troop occupies territory. They moved largely from a service and self-defense kind of organization into an organization that adopted what was essentially a siege mentality. Let us arm ourselves to defend ourselves because if we don't, we're all dead. And of course, that's the way that, uh, that things ultimately played out. Huey Newton. Huey Newton fell apart, started abusing drugs. And one day I walked in the house over there where I stayed, and he's got a big brick of cocaine. I says, what is this? Oh, you don't understand. He's half out. Oh, we're going to raise some money for the bar. I said, it's not like this, Huey. I said, not like this. I said, this is cheap. I said, do you realize politically they will destroy us with this bullshit? With the demise of the Black Panther Party, into that gap stepped the gangs, the drug traffickers, and so forth. The Crips and the Bloods are a direct uh, child, if you were, of the demise of the Black Panther Party. While the Panthers collapse, fueled by FBI counterintelligence tactics, took years. White radicals self-destructed almost overnight.
tiny handful of white radicals, including a group that called itself the Weather Underground, called for armed revolution. But for most of the anti-war movement, this seemed both futile and morally irresponsible. This was very painful to see uh, people who you trusted and were close to sort of seem to flip out and start saying things like, if you're not ready to pick up the gun, you're not serious. I mean, it just sounded crazy. We grew up really believing in America and what it stood for. Vietnam came along and A, it, I think most importantly, it violated our, our view of America because we were killing uh, innocent peasants. But B, on a very deep psychological level, uh, to realize that your elders are prepared to see you die for an unworthy cause, for something you don't want to go die for, I think uh, threw us into a moral abyss. Americans were shocked by the trial of Lieutenant William Calley. Calley was accused and convicted of massacring villagers in the Vietnamese village of My Lai. Soon after, it was revealed that the U.S. had been secretly bombing Laos and Cambodia. Ambassador Sullivan, in that cool, dignified way he has, uh, said, we, the United States has never bombed any civilian targets in, in Laos. And I hear this voice, it was one of these, you know, out-of-body experiences of Senator Kennedy going, well, excuse me, Ambassador, but I understand there's a, uh, a young man in the room who's just been returned from Laos, and, and I suddenly stand up, you know, and, and uh, I, I remember my heart churning, my, but I, I was surprised when I saw the footage recently that I was very calm, I was even smoking a cigarette, and I said, well, um, you know, Ambassador Sullivan is simply not telling the truth, I've interviewed thousands of of peasants, every single one says their village was destroyed, people had been murdered. It's simply not true that we're not bombing Laos. Of the 27 million young men of draft age during the war, slightly over two million, or 6%, saw combat in Vietnam. A small but vocal minority of Vietnam vets returned to speak out against the war. In April 1971, they brought their message to Washington, D.C. and the nation's television cameras. <laughs> Vietnam veterans marched on the Supreme Court, calling for the court to declare the war unconstitutional. Another group of veterans, including John Kerry, testified before Congress. And finally, this administration has done us the ultimate dishonor. They have attempted to disown us and the sacrifices we made for this country. veterans coming back from Vietnam and protesting against the war and forming the veterans against the war, uh, I mean, to me that was perhaps the, uh, the most powerful evidence that the government can have that they had to do something about stopping the war. The demonstration culminated with a group of veterans returning the combat medals they had earned in Vietnam. I just turn in my Vietnam service ribbons. One bronze star for heroism, which was really asinine. <laughs> one purple heart. I'd like to say just one thing to the people of Vietnam. God, I'm sorry.
We did end the war. We didn't just try to, we did. The real debate between us and our critics concerned months. Could it have been ended a year earlier, six months earlier? How do I know? It was not until 1973 that a ceasefire agreement was signed and the last U.S. troops came home. But the seeds for Nixon's political demise were sown by a massive leak of secret government documents. The documents would come to be known as the Pentagon Papers. The man who leaked the documents was Daniel Ellsberg. If I hadn't believed that the war was about to get larger, um, I wouldn't have uh, exposed myself to a life in prison just to set the record straight. And he told us about how he and Tony Russo uh, while they were with the Rand Corporation, had secretly copied 7,000 pages of this top secret document, which became known as the Pentagon Papers, uh, and how they were going to reveal it to the public. Ellsberg is one of the brightest people I have ever met. I knew him at Harvard. At that time, he was a hardliner. And he had gone to Vietnam to help organize anti-guerrilla activities and even to participate in them. When he came back, uh, he turned. I had secret inside information from my work in the White House for Henry Kissinger at the very beginning of the administration that Nixon had never intended to get out with anything other than success. Not one of those 15,000 Pentagon papers did any damage to Nixon. All those papers, every last one of them, dealt with the Johnson and Kennedy administration. The Pentagon Papers offered a detailed and devastating indictment of U.S. policy in Vietnam. They revealed the lies Kennedy and Johnson had told the public, the years of secret bombing raids in Laos, and the CIA intelligence reports that consistently undercut official presidential statements characterizing the war. That was their great claim. We know stuff you don't know. Remember that? Now I would say we know everything that they knew. We've got the documents, and we see there was absolutely no logical justification for what they did, and they knew it all along. You know, it's astounding. President Nixon set out to destroy Daniel Ellsberg's reputation. The White House plumbers, so named for their assignment to stop leaks, broke into the office of Ellsberg's psychiatrist. They escaped that time. But a year later, during the 1972 presidential campaign, the plumbers were caught breaking into Democratic National Headquarters in the Watergate building. What surprised me was Watergate. I could not believe that anybody that successful, uh, and, and obviously he could see the success he was about to have, would get himself into a mess like that. It was, that was unbelievable, and I take it to be an expression of the deepest insecurity, personal insecurity. On August 8, 1974, under threat of impeachment, Richard M. Nixon resigned as President of the United States. Without the Vietnam War, there would have been, of course, no Pentagon Papers and no, no Watergate. It works the other way, too. Without Watergate, the war would have gone on for years. But the impact of the 60s was not limited to American foreign policy. The environmental, gay rights, and women's movements, all born in the 60s, would, in the decades that followed, grow huge and have a profound impact on American society. You went from civil rights to anti-war to women to gay. I mean, you can trace that. The largest ever demonstration for women's rights underscored the rapid advances women seemed to be making. The House of Representatives passed the Equal Rights Amendment, and new abortion laws in New York State would help lay the groundwork for nationwide abortion protection in Roe v. Wade three years later. The 60s are one of these amazing moments in history. There are not very many of them. When down a number of channels come people of very different sorts who 
simultaneously get it into their heads that um, the world doesn't have to be what it was or what it's assumed to be. On balance, the 60s are a success because of what they did for black people and for women and for gay people and even for handicapped people. I mean, it really it empowers everybody. We have reason to look back and to feel good about the work that we have engaged in, the blood we've shed, even the lives that we've lost. All has been ultimately for the good. Former activists remember the 60s as a time when they felt empowered, a time when change seemed possible and idealism flourished. But others remember those days very differently. For them, the 60s were a disturbing time, a time when America's fundamental values seem threatened. I think there's an amount of bitterness and animosity that our generation is going to carry to its grave. Uh, it tore the nation apart. And I think to some degree we're still fr suffering from that. It was the age of selfishness. It was the age of self-indulgence. It was the age of uh, anti-authority. Uh, it was an age in which uh, people uh, did all kinds of wrong things. That was the start, really, of the drug problem in the United States. To people who were con of a conservative bent, everything seemed threatening, and it all seemed indistinguishably threatening, indissolubly threatening. You know, the Beatles saying they're as popular as Jesus. You might as well be trashing the American flag. You might as well be dodging the draft. To them, it all looked like the same thing. Me and my friends who were, you know, taking drugs and practicing all sorts of excess were also dedicating our lives to learning about the environment, learning about how to grow chemical-free food, learning about what health is, studying acupuncture, becoming nurses, becoming healers. The fact that these ideas and premises that have so affected mainstream culture came out of contradictory people is not a reason to invalidate them. It should be an urge for you to do better. We did the best we could. We came from a different generation. I know that my generation worked to make things better for all people, and that's about the best you can do in life. It's important for the youth of a generation to feel that they can change the world because they really can, because the youth of the world are the conscience of the world, and we depend on them to make things change. And that was a time of tremendous change where youth were tremendously motivated. It would be good to see that happen again. The 60s, the years that shaped a generation, was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.